Hey guys, Crypto Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. Maybe you've watched my previous videos on the amazing smart telescope, uh, the ZW C-Star S50 that costs around $500 and maybe you've actually ordered one. Maybe you've received yours or you hope to receive it before Christmas maybe a bit later as well. I know it's been in very high demand, uh, but I want to make this video to basically provide you with some tips and tricks on how to make the best use of this telescope, as well as some cheap accessories you can buy for this telescope to make it even better. Okay, the first thing that I want to mention is when you access the C-Star app and you've connected it to the to your C-Star telescope, this is the interface that you get. And you get a few cool, you know, two nights best type of targets uh, that, are, that are here, as well as some cool little uh, recommendations at the bottom. Uh, but you should not stop yourself with just uh, two nights best uh, because there is a more exhaustive list of the two night tonight's best targets that's available in the Sky Atlas. So what you can do is access the, the Sky Atlas using the button at the uh, in the toolbar at the bottom, or you can also access it after going into stargazing and pressing the icon in the bottom right to access that star atlas. Now, what's really cool with that star atlas is that you can, you know, look around for cool lo looking targets, as well as you can search for objects in here. And one of the biggest uh, prominent items there is the two nights best uh, item, which you can tap, and then you get a much broader list of objects that are available to you at uh, this given time. You can, you have two buttons on each. You have gazing and you have center. Gazing will actually immediately have the telescope move to point to that target and center it. I typically try to do center first because I want to see where in the sky the object is located to see whether I have visibility to the object. Otherwise, it's like useless. So I can click on center here and you can see, okay, the, um, the atlas is now centered on this object. So this is the wizard nebula and uh, I can r relatively see, okay, it was around here. It's close to the zenith and it's roughly in the northern direction. Therefore, I can see it from my balcony, right? This gives you a good idea quickly of where the object is located and whether you have access to it. Uh, you also have like a blue square that's available and that is where the scope is currently pointing. One of the other ways that you can uh, check, you know, where exactly an object is located is once you've searched for it, for instance, in the uh, catalog, you can tap on it and you can see we have an object picture description and then uh, a graph here that tells you roughly in which direction the object is located. You can see that right now that object is to the northeast and it's also at an altitude of 64 degrees, so an angle from the horizontal of 64 degrees. And that chart tells you that angle with in function of time. So at midnight, so at zero here, we can see it's going to be roughly at 60 degrees. At 4 a.m., it's gonna be at 30 degrees. So that's how you can use this object to understand, or this graph to understand also where the object is going to be located. But you see, let's say that I have centered an object on the uh, Sky Atlas, then if you want to actually make the telescope move to that object and center it, you want to press the go to button here at the bottom right. And this will actually make the telescope go and center that object. At any given time, you can also click or tap on the top left little arrow there that brings you back to the stargazing menu that I showed a moment ago. And you can juggle between the two very easily. If you're ever imaging an object and you realize it has drifted outside of the field of view for whatever reason, maybe you kicked the telescope a little bit, then you can always go back to the sky at last, press the go to button again, and it will recenter it. So if you ever get lost, the sky at last is your way home. So that is for the first tip. Now, our second little tip, and this has come with a firmware update after my initial review of the telescope. And at 
after some of the feedback that I provided ZW, you can tap on the telescope image on the top right of the main screen of the application. And by doing so, you'll be accessing a variety of settings. Now, one of the settings that was always there, but I forgot to mention in my original video is the anti dew setting. This will heat up the lens of your telescope to avoid dew forming on the lens and thus clouding your image. This obviously will use battery. So use it only if you need it. Note that in many instances, uh, glass surfaces can be extremely prone to dew, it, especially at night, especially when it's pointing upwards to the sky because your glass surface, your lens is radiating heat away from it and cooling faster than the ambient air. So you have a very uh, small layer of cold air that we that will form around your lens and cold air can contain less humidity than hot air so what happens is the humidity will condense on your lens this anti-dew which has always been there as this as a setting will help avoid that but one of the other things that i really like that's been added is under advanced feature at the bottom you have a new button which is save all frames and this is for power users for people who want to do post processing on the images that the C star has taken. And basically, how the C star works after it's pointed to a target and you've started doing light accumulation on it, it will take many 10 second exposures, and it will pre present you with a stack of those exposures. So it takes one exposure, then it takes a second one, and it stacks it on top, then it takes a third one, and it stacks it on top of the two other, etc. And by default, you only get that final result. The C star will save that fi final result as a JPEG and also as a raw file in a format that we call fit format, which is an astrophotography format, which is already awesome. But with this save all frame frames option, you can actually save all of those individual 10 second frames. And if that is turned on, the C star will save each of those individual frames that were successfully stacked because sometimes it takes exposure of 10 seconds. There was start trailing, the tracking didn't work well, and the exposure was discarded. In that case, it will not get saved. It only saves the frames that it deemed to be successful. And also those frames are dark calibrated. If you have no idea what that means, it just means that some uh, sensor issues have been removed from your frame using a dark calibration technique. It's a good thing, in other words. So that's for advanced users. And now I want to mention another option in this uh, C-Star menu here, which has been added in a recent firmware update, which is the focus here. And you can see that when I tap on it, there is three options available, actually just really two that are user changeable. And one is the focus panel. And this is where I am going to start. This can be useful for both beginners, but also advanced users if you want to get perfect pinpoint stars, perfect focus in your images. Now, of course, the ZWC star has star autofocus that works really well by default. So this is really, if you really want to get the best focus and you don't trust the autofocus, this is what you can use. So first, let me go to the default settings, which is focus panel is turned off. So once I have turned off focus panel, which is the default, and I go to stargazing, I'm going to skip that simply my, my telescope is not level right now. It doesn't matter. But you can see that on the left hand side here, there is nothing. There is no toolbar. This is the default. Now, if I go back to my settings here and I go to focus and I enable the focus panel. Now, when I come back to stargazing, I have a toolbar available on the left and that lets me adjust the focus precisely beyond what uh, C the C star did with autofocus. And you can use the double arrows to do like very um, rough focus adjustments. You, you see I'm getting more and more out of focus. And I can go to the other direction of the focus and, and put uh, my, my stars back into focus. You can see the stars are now visible in the image. I see uh, star drift. This is normal. I'm currently not tracking. And the single arrows are just finer settings. What you want to pay attention to as well is the number that you see. You saw that the number, when I press the double arrows here, it changes. And uh, when I press the single arrows, it also changes. This is basically the index of your focus. And that number can be useful because once you know you have good focus, uh, here let's say that 17, 1702 is my good focus, I can go into the options back 
and click on focus again and then I have star focus position and I can set a default focus position to tell the telescope that okay this is your focusing index that you, you should be starting with that way it will always start up to that focus position so you should be roughly in focus and you'll want to rechange it from time to time as you know temperatures and seasons change for instance but that's a very cool feature to have for more like advanced fine control of the telescope functions but if you're a beginner in astrophotography, you may not realize that getting star focus is actually super, super difficult. It's actually extremely difficult to judge just by looking at an image, whether the star is perfectly in focus or you're just out of focus, but you cannot tell. And while you cannot tell in very short exposures, once you do a very long light accumulation, then the poor focus will manifest itself. But we have a way to achieve perfect focus, and this is via a 3D printed accessory here that is called a Batinov mask. So let me explain this. This is a Batinov mask that is made by my friend, friend Luke from the YouTube channel Lucomatico. I'll put the link down below, and of course, I'll put the link to this little accessory as well. It's roughly 10 US dollars, so it's not uh, super expensive, and it's on eBay. Again, I'll have the links down there, and let me show you how to use it. I'll show you the, the whole sequence of usage of, of of that thing but once you're re ready to put it on the scope which is not immediately you'll just slot it in like that and you're good to go you have your bat enough mask on bat enough mask on bat enough mask off there is uh nothing really to hold it in place be besides like a little uh, flange here so you don't want to be using it while pointing the scope down because it might fall although here it hasn't fallen so it does stay in place relatively well Okay, so you just need to remember when you need to put the Batinov mask on and when you want to remove it. And one of the things that's very important is to not forget to remove it. Anyway, let me set the telescope down and together we'll be pointing it at a bright star so we can use this Batinov mask to achieve pretty much perfect focus. Okay, so I have my telescope set up properly this time. And what we want to do when we want to do precise focusing manually rather than just relying on the autofocus, and so we'll be using this Batinov mask here, is we want to find a bright star to point to. So you can use the Sky Atlas for that. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. I'm going to go inside the uh, Sky Atlas and I can search for objects. And right now, the star called Deneb should be visible. This is because I'm familiar with the night sky. Otherwise, you can just just like look around and say like oh okay I see uh, somewhere uh, well right now it's I'm looking downwards but let's say let's look above the horizon and you can see oh yeah there's this star Deneb here that looks to be really high up it's gonna be very easy for me to get to so I can uh, tap on, uh, on Deneb here and say that I want to go gazing towards uh, Deneb so there I've selected Deneb uh, I could have done it via the search as well so just like go in there uh, set uh, to Deneb and then I can click on go gazing and this will basically directly point the telescope to Deneb and we've done uh, we're done with the centering of Deneb so I now have a very bright star in the field of view I'm roughly in focus right now so I'm just going to get myself out of focus a little bit to show you how it's going to look at look like so now I have a bright star in my field of view and I am going to put on the Batinov mask and let's see what happens once I put it on. And this is how it looks like. We have this uh, weird shape and you can see we have two diagonal spikes and then a horizontal spike that is supposed to actually be at the exact center of the other two. And so we'll be moving the focus. So let's say, let's try to move it in this direction a little bit. And you can see the horizontal spike actually goes downwards. It means we are going further away from focus. This is not the right direction. I want to use the double arrows at the bottom and you can see that now the, the uh, center spike is actually properly going towards the center. So let's keep going, let's keep going, let's keep going, let's keep going. Okay, so we're getting close right now. I'm gonna zoom in, but you can see as I zoom in, I've gone too far in the other direction. So now I can go more slowly, like, like do one step and then wait to see the impact until we get uh, a proper, very centered uh, center spike. And here it is. I think this is really well centered. And this is how the Batinov mask lets you achieve perfect focus here.
So now we are very well centered and you can uh, see that the index position is 1701, which is very close to the 1702 that I was using earlier. Uh, single focus steps will not make a huge difference. So this is good. It means that we are now in focus and then I, I can go to my imaging. Before you go to your imaging, don't forget to remove the button of mask. This is a classic mistake. Forget about it. Another tip uh, with this uh, telescope is when to use the light pollution filter that is integrated within the telescope. And uh, what happens is if you're using the Sky Atlas or any of the like uh, go-to features of the telescope, if you go to objects and tonight, tonight's best, for instance, and you select an object, the telescope will point to the object and it will automatically set the light pollution filter uh, depending on whether the object is a suitable target for that light pollution filter. The light pollution fil filter is integrated within the scope. So the scope has that filter already inside and it just gets turned on and off. And it's switched between this light pollution filter and also an IR cut filter. And if you're going to point to a galaxy, for instance, the light pollution filter will be off because it's actually better not to use it for galaxies. But if you're pointing to an emission nebula uh, from the uh, tonight's best section, for example, the cocoon nebula here or the Pac-Man nebula, after you point to it, after the telescope has finished centering the target, it will automatically turn on that filter. However, if you're just playing around in the Sky Atlas and you say like, oh, I want to capture this area here because it looks cool. Uh, this is an area of nebulosity. This is actually probably an emission nebula. But if you go to it and start imaging, the scope doesn't know that this should be a good target, a good candidate for the light pollution filter. So you want to turn it on manually. And to know whether you should turn it on manually or not is you should know whether your target has uh, basically emission, emission nebulae in there. So that can be a bit tricky. You can Google it, you can Wikipedia it, you can search around. Uh, but when you, typically when you see, you see strands of nebulosity that are of like a reddish or brownish color like we see here, it's emis emission nebula. And so the uh, LP filter that's within the telescope will be helpful for you. So that was another little tip with when to set up this filter. Although by default, it's kind of set up automatically by t the telescope because that's a little uh, smart telescope. Okay, now we've covered the whole focus stuff. We've covered the uh, new functionalities in the firmware. We've looked at some tips and tricks involving the Sky Atlas. Now let's go to the last topic of the video. And this is really more if you're already into astrophotography and you're an advanced astrophotographer, you probably have a whole range of filters that you have accumulated over the years, light pollution filters, narrowband filters, all the good stuff, and how you wish you could use them with the C-Star, right? And your wish is granted. The same guy, Luke from Lucomatico YouTube channel, also designed a filter holder that can slot inside the uh, in front of the C-Star lens to use your two inch filters that you already own. So let's see how it looks. So the filter holder will be delivered like this and you have uh, plastic, plastic screws or thumb screws on the side that you can remove. Mine actually came with a spare uh, screw, so I don't know if that's really uh, intentional, but I got uh, three screws instead, instead of two. And you can see it comes off into two parts. One has a pretty uh, large flange uh, here, and this is going to be the part that we insert inside the uh, telescope slot. And the other part actually has a little recess there, and this is we're going, where we're going to slot the filter. So I'm going to be using a narrowband filter, a dual narrowband filter here, which is the uh, Altair dual band H-alpha oxygen 3 with very, very narrow band passes of 4 nanometers, which are much better than the light pollution filter that is already included within the uh, ZWC star telescope. And that can be extremely helpful in very light polluted cities like Tokyo or during periods like the full moon. A good budget option, by the way, if you're interested, would be something like the Optolong L Extreme, or there is also an SV Boney, like a really budget option. There is an SV Boney dual band narrowband filter. I forget the name right now, but I will put links down in the description to both of those filters and also the Altair one if you're uh, interested. Now, just so you know, this Altair filter on its own, this is this piece 
piece of glass here costs almost as much as the whole Seastar S50. Uh, the Optolong and SV Boni filters are much cheaper. Anyway, let's slot it in. So we have the part of the adapter that has the recess, and I'll just be slotting in my filter in, into that recess. So now I have the filter sitting on, uh, on the adapter here. And then I can sandwich that filter with the uh, other side of the ad adapter, making sure the flange is, flange is fa facing away from the filter. And then I can insert the screws to tighten the uh, filter sandwich that we have here. And so here I have my filter sandwich with the filter in the middle and the two thumb screws basically holding the filter in there. I also have the flange here that I can insert into the telescope. And the way to insert it is just like before, you want to slot in the flange into the aperture of the C-Star telescope. Obviously, this is not set in place securely, so do not forget to remove it before you turn off the telescope. Otherwise, as the telescope lens is starting to point downwards, this will fall off because you have the additional weight of the filter in here. Uh, so be careful when you're using this. This is at your own risk. And I highly suggest that you just like slot in the filter after you've pointed at stars, especially if you're using a narrowband filters, it might reduce the luminosity of stars enough that the C star will have trouble centering uh, the objects that you pointed to. So it's a good strategy to first center the object. And then once it's uh, centered and you've done the autofocus, you can slot the filter here in front. And by the way, that filter, because it is in front of the optics, it should not affect the uh, focus distance. So it should not make the focus worse if you are wondering. That little adapter here uh, costs 18 US dollars, as far as I can tell. And it's honestly, it's really super cool. With that, I hope this was useful, this series of tips and tricks, as well as uh, little uh, accessories to use with that telescope that are pretty cheap as well. Uh, so you can have a lot of fun with it once it finally arrives at your do doorstep, or even if you already have it, you can already have a lot of fun with it as well. Uh, please let me know your thoughts in the comments, but also if you've been using this telescope and you have other tips and tricks, let us know down in the comments. So go ahead and check it, them out to see if there were any good suggestions in there. And while you're at it, you know, leave a comment, let us know what you think about this telescope, about those tips and tricks. You can like the video as well, subscribe to the channel, in which case, welcome to the channel. And if you want to get more clear skies, 30% more clear skies guaranteed, you can and join my channel as a member or as a Patreon. The links are down in the description. But thank you so much to all of my channel members and Patreon supporters because you guys truly make the channel possible. Besides all of that, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for supporting me. It really means the world. More important than all of that though, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.